You're listening to Don't Waste Water. The core and the heart of Grandfoss is to reach 300 million people. It's a huge ambition by 2030. It's not an aspiration. It's real life in the organization. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. Everyone's incredibly upset with CSO kind of usage at the moment, which is because everyone's become aware of it rather than it being a new thing. Isn't that like the first ever victim on record of machine learning? <laughs> yeah, you could seal them up and none of the CSOs would discharge. But the amount of domestic flooding you'd get on the back of that. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Laura Galindo and Phil Tomlinson as my guests. But if we don't start getting a kind of a broader stakeholder engagement on this to actually try and solve the problem rather than just solving bits of the problem, we're going to sp- well, we'll spend the rest of our careers talking about it. Yeah. Laura is Global Director of Strategic Marketing and Communications and Phil is Digital Solutions Leader at Grundfos. We are the first one solutions company with a validated SBTI, so the science-based net zero target which is a huge process to even be approved. So with pride that we change frameworks, we had to hire experts to even get there, right? So this means that we have a whole roadmap. By 2030, we are committed to 50% reduction in absolute numbers of scope one and two. But 99% of our footprint is in scope three. So although this sounds fancy, it is a huge challenge to get that resolved when a product's out of our game. Grundfos pioneers solutions to the world's water and climate challenges, and on a down-to-earth note, they are simply the largest pump manufacturer in the world. If I stopped you at the next water conference, say Rethinking Water at the end of September or WefTech at the beginning of October, and asked you who's the third largest water tech company in the world, would you spontaneously answer me Grundfos? Well, if I had to bet, I'd say no, and I would certainly not blame you for that. Yet, with a $5.1 billion water turnover, Grundfos is not so far apart from its somewhat closest competitor, Xylem, which does $7.4 billion a year, with the integration of Evoqua. So why are they flying under the radar? Well, one may say because I had Xylem five times on the podcast with a sixth one in the making, while Grundfos is here for the first time. But don't get fooled by my lame content planning, understanding Grundfos water strategy, how it evolved over the past five years, and how they're shaping it for the next five ones is a treasure of opportunities. Whether you're a potential user of Grundfos Solutions, a company in their supplier value chain, or or a growth stage player that would like to entertain the idea to be Grundfos's next Metasphere, Waterworks, or Eurowater, in this episode, you'll learn what it takes for a traditional pump company to transform into a leading water solutions provider, and how Grundfos is planning to provide water access to 300 million people by 2030. You'll hear what role digital innovation plays in the company's future plans and how they tackle the challenges of wastewater management. But you'll also get to know their four main verticals, strategic focus, their plan towards net zero, their take on sustainable aquifer management and combined sewer overflows, and much more I can't pack into this intro. So without further ado, let me remind you that if you like what you hear, please leverage your next coffee break to recommend this podcast to a friend, a colleague, your boss, or your team, and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Laura. I feel oh, welcome to the show. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm curious to have grown force on that microphone, because if we had had that conversation, let's say five years ago, it would sound not weird. I'm working for a piping company. I know that the pumping company can be as interesting as a piping company, but still kind of out of context in the scene of being a water player. But lots of things have changed. And I guess it all started with the acquisition of Eurowater. Or did you have another step before which I missed? Let's put some context here, right? I have been in the water industry for 10 years. I was in DuPont and on the water treatment side and joined Grandfors nine months ago. They are kind of on the edge of this transformation journey, right? That started with a huge reorg that actually intend to focus on the verticals and be very market face to be able to enable innovation, MA activities, and the four verticals that uh, you know were born with this reorg. One of them is water utilities. Mm-hmm. So I'd say more so when we really had uh, emphasis on the target of the utilities and the, the other side is agriculture um, and, and farmers and things like that. But especially in the utility side, I think enable us and empower us to set a direction on this strategy. So MA, I think is 
both speaking the highest to our innovation, especially in digital space. But Grandfos, I think, is really rebranding itself to prove that it's way more than a pump company. It's already in the DNA, and now it needs to be perceived in the brand to have what it takes. And we are, have a roadmap that hopefully will stand out in the market strongly. I had that conversation on the microphone, I think, two years ago with Patrick Decker, who then was the CEO of Xylem. And I asked him, is it right to say that Xylem is on a transformational journey? Maybe 10 years ago, you still were a pump company. You were far more than that, but you were seen by the market yes. like a pump company. Yes. And more and more, you're a solution provider and you're kind of bridging different parts of the industry. Is the journey over? That is correct. But the journey is not over. We have been on a transformation. We will continue to be on a transformation and a transformation, not just in terms of what we bring into our portfolio of solutions from a product and technology standpoint, but also how we work in different ways based on our core. Would that be a fair comparison? And is that kind of what you're heading towards? Or do you really craft your own path? I believe that... Um both Xylin and Grunfels, they're equipped in different ways to, to really show up as a water solution company. I, I just think that the nature that we do not only do marketing strategies and the paths we take are unique. And Grunfels is really bringing that um, family private-owned DNA, right? So 87.5% of Grandfels is owned by the foundation. And just this gives us the ability to think on how we combine charity, how we combine a scaling financial trust fund module, right? Uh, with some partners that were even speaking here today that we are in, in conversations, how we embed what access in our business module as the core and heart of Grandfels is to reach 300 million people. It's a huge ambition. By 2030. 300 million people by 2030, 2030, which means you have a metric for 2024? Yeah, that, that's the thing. This ambition is a huge statement. We're not byproduct of the number. We're going to surpass it. If possible, you want to discuss what it takes to get there and, and be very open and transparent on saying that's not easy and what are just difficult and what are going to do different to reach that. So one of the things you're going to do that actually you're going to have a spoiler here is a partnership with The Economist, Intelligent Unit of The Economist, uh, okay. where we're going to lead the way on helping the industry understanding how we can really be assertive and reliable, right? By having a third-party validation on the parameters to measure access. So different players, they have out there different kind of targets by different years. What really wanted to kind of be accountable for, the, for the industry to be accountable for, is um, about the measurement. So this is going to be a tool that's really going to be enable the industry. Well, that's not us saying something we will do. We're actively doing it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what the 2024 number is, but we have a whole team of people who are actively doing this. And there's a whole set of the organization that's sculpted into actually how we push and pursue these and whether it's through our own solutions and in pushing that through or whether it's putting the right thing into market but ultimately with the SDG6 goal in mind it's not an aspiration it's real life in the organisation Phil as you're taking the microphone who of you arrived into Grunfos first you as the external acquisition out of XPV portfolio and now into Grunfos's Yep. very rich uh, family of solutions or you you mentioned you are in for nine months oh, if I had to bet <laughs> um, yeah well actually I'm a little less than nine months for Grumfoss but obviously I've been with Metasphere for 12 years so I've, I've come with Metasphere as part of the acquisition um, and I've now moved into working directly for Grumfoss and the digital leadership team let's first get everybody up to date so that we then discuss Metasphere and how you integrate into Grumfoss but what's Metasphere how does it start and how does it lead to the acquisition by Grumfoss Metasphere are an IoT analytics business that are focused on water and wastewater networks for municipalities. That's probably 98% of their, percent of their business. Operating across the UK, Europe, the Middle East and Australia. Particularly strong presence in Australia as well as the UK. They started really in 2006 as a management buyout of Logica, doing regional control telemetry systems through to RTU, mains power control, data loggers. And then the last probably 10 years we've become much better known for our wastewater network services. Whether it's monitoring of CSOs or SSOs so depending on where you are in the world, as well as pump station integration, treatment work integrations, control systems, and in the last couple of years with the Art Sewer Solution into kind of the mass visibility of wastewater networks, integrating lots of kind of in visual kind of data from the networks, as well as into analytics. So you can really get some strong visibility of the problems you're seeing and how we challenge those. And so your key investor used to be XPV until 2023, when you change home, and now you're part of Grunfos. That's right, yeah. Are you still in the integration process or 
Are you now a full part of Grundfos? That might vary who you ask, to be honest. <laughs> I ask you first. Yeah, no, no, no. So it's, no, not between us, but possibly between people. So Metasphere is still a standalone business within the water utility division of Grundfos, which probably explains why I say it depends who you ask. Whereas obviously I've stepped across and I now fully work for Grundfos. The team who, apart from me with a transition who came over, are still working and driving Metasphere forward. So you spun out out of Metasphere and now you're part of Grundfos straight ahead. Yeah, that's right. Okay. What's your role then at Grundfos? So I'm the digital solutions leader for water utilities. There's four of us in the digital leadership team and my role is very much looking at actually, I sit between product development, product management, the tech and innovation function and the Metasphere development functions to look at how we bring and collate the right solutions together for the market. It's interesting one for me having been a commercial director in this space for a really long time but with the market understanding say actually this is what we need to do and how do we align the organization to deliver that. When you say need to do is it stuff which can be done internally by moving pieces or does that mean adding new parts of the puzzle and eventually further builds what Quantfos will be offering in the future? Both from my perspective. So there are things that where we link Metasphere solutions and the analytics arm of Metasphere, which is formerly called Meniscus, into some of the existing Grundfos digital solutions, some of the existing Grundfos physical solutions, but also how we work with our partners, how we work with partners. Metasphere if historically work with how we work with new partners and new new market entrants is, is very much part of the option we're not only in there we'll do it ourselves or we'll acquire now you always get to that stage if you work with another party and there's a natural fit it's always an option and it's always a potentially good option if you're the small party in that conversation you know that's not the be and end all let's just check the first principles because i don't want to give the impression that grundfos is paying monopoly because the foundation has money and can just spend it i guess not i guess i'm pretty sure of it there must be a rational behind those moves as to what to build across what verticals you mentioned four different verticals mm -hmm. how did you come up with four verticals do you know why you picked those mm -hmm. and then let's take the one you're specifically building to understand how the build-up is happening yeah let's put some context here on ground Force, right so we're talking about at the end of the second world war 1945 the founder in his basement came up with you know a, a very innovative pump for that time and and, and since then have been leading the way on that kind of innovation and adjunct pump. But we have spread in 100 countries. We have 60 entities. But we had to understand what markets we want to play to win. So with that strategy assessment, we decided that commercial, domestic, industry, and what utilities would be the four verticals. So they, I would say that uh, industry, as always, has kind of that... Uh, volume and presence, right? They, they all have their importance, of course, and their strategic representation. The water utilities, it speaks very closely to the purpose. And uh, that's not for coincidence that the safe water division, that's our water access. So it's an actual mm -hmm. business as a PNL, and we, we have customers and all of that. So this is under the umbrella of water utilities, right? But this is aligned with our mothership. It's the 300 million I mentioned. What's the difference between commercial and industrial? When you talk about domestic, you're talking about the, the heating, the cooling, mm -hmm. in, in, in residential, right? Yep. Environment. And then for commercial, we're talking about buildings and institutions. So like hotels larger. or um, apartment okay. blocks. Yes. Anyway. And it's a really interesting operational split because obviously it was done to keep the teams closer to their customer bases and become more specialized. But the products available within each of the divisions are not uniquely available to those divisions. So each of the divisions cross sells across their functions to that. That Again, that's physical and digital. A stupid question to a company which is under a foundation and which hence doesn't report any numbers publicly, but I will still try. If we take the water utility vertical, What's your turnover and do you have targets to grow it in the next, let's say, five, ten years? There are always targets. I guess you have, but do you have some you can share? <laughs> we can report. So last year, in 2023, we reported 4.6 uh, billion of euros in revenue across all divisions. The oil utilities is smallest in revenue with the biggest potential for growth, especially in the municipal market. You look at the US as the single largest utility market. The headquarters for the water utility division is based in just out of Houston in Brookshire in Texas uh, for a very strategic position in the US. So we are a player, but in, when you're talking about scaling the, the water utilities uh, vertical, municipal, uh, is something that's going to be key. And playing in wastewater and Metasphere is back here, a great ally for us, really create a new role 
in the value chain and unlock not only what Metasphere is bringing immediately or if they don't have own security, but how the telemetry, how the sensors, how IoT going to play a key component for us in our innovation roadmap only associate that with pumps and our controls and everything else. So, But still within water utility, you will have like the sexy part, oh. drinking water. <laughs> and uh, I'm a waste water guy, so I'm allowing myself to say that. And the not so sexy part, which is everything linked to sewer and wastewater. And then within that not so sexy part, you can take the noble part, which is the wastewater treatment plant. Or you can really take the literal shithole, which is the, the network and the sewer network. And you say, that's that's my spot. How do you end up focusing on that? And what's the market ratio or the challenge which you want to overcome where you think you have a differentiated approach and differentiated solution? I wouldn't say that there is the clean water versus wastewater sex separation you described there. I think there is definitely a process to network separation within the organization. So you think about how they might be using commercial or industry. It's very processed part of a network, an internal clean network, then that definitely falls into that category. But I think for, for wastewater, it's an area that has a huge amount of focus for innovation in the organization at the moment. Actually, from a from a divisional piece, a lot of the upcoming programs and products that we were coming through are in that sector. It's not just around the the kind of IoT space that, that Metasphere sits in. It is that how do we address this whole space as an organization and take a really concerted approach to try and drive change in this space. But why would wastewater have a greater potential for innovation than drinking water? My personal view is it's it's globally behind. If you look at the investment profiles and where money's been spent, and this is across by utilities, by investors, as well as by an R&D and supply chain, if you look at the last 40 years, I would say 35 years of that has been highly focused on clean water, whether it's leakage, whether it's NRW, whether it's just connecting things to it, metering, for example, that's where the focus has been. Europe, more broadly and very specifically the UK, the last 10 years, there's been a real increase in investment in water wastewater US. the us is a bit it's probably a bit more balanced but it's the nature of the structure of the market is quite different over there i think it definitely follows that there's a lot more to be done in wastewater it's not it's definitely not around the the kind of zeitgeist piece around this actually everyone's incredibly upset with cso kind of usage at the moment which is because everyone's become aware of it rather than it being a new thing on that specific combined sewer overflow cso isn't that like the first ever victim on record of machine learning <laughs> Because to me, it's like nobody ever looked what was happening and it was happening. But all of a sudden you get a machine's brain who can see that there are patterns in flow and that those patterns mean that not all the water is flowing until the, the wastewater treatment plant where we measure the flow. So it must be spilling from somewhere and then you look at that somewhere and you find out to be the CSOs. I would actually say it wasn't that sophisticated. And I would say probably 99% of networks don't have that level of sophistication today. Purely That's a, not a network, it would be like the treatment plants which uh, would yeah. see. Uh, so you look at uh, you look at overflow point at the network, yeah. So uh, bypass kind of storm channels at, at treatment work are an interesting, very sensible protection protection mechanism. But the challenges they present in terms of the environmental challenge of that is is a really difficult conversation to have because it's if you don't do that and you actually destroy your biological process at works, well, what what are you going to do for the next six months? You can't reverse the hydraulics of the network. So if you take out the treatment work, so you're just going to be bypassing through that storm channel anyway. Let me just get it in my work because I, I had your explanation before we recorded. So I want to get everybody on, on that understanding level because what you say here is super interesting and super important, which is basically when you have an overflow in the sewers, there's a rain event, the first wave might be loaded, but the next waves are water. So you have a lot of water. One option is to use the overflow and then to flush it to the river, which has environmental consequences. The other option is to drive everything to the wastewater treatment plant, which, yeah. and that's where your input is super interesting. If you're Putting all that water with low loads or different loads compared to what's usual into your biology, basically you're washing off your biology. And then, of course, you have a better control over what's going to flow into the river, but a biology needs weeks to months to recover, which means that your quality of treatment overall is going to suffer for the next weeks months, at best probably. two months yeah, yeah that is the first time today i'm hearing that probably because i wasn't listening to the right people probably but still that is super interesting because that puts into perspective what's happening with the cso it's a choice mm. it's a bad choice but that's actually there's but it really there's probably two main reasons that they were designed to networks one is to protect the works but the very original reason was actually to stop properties flooding further down the chain they're often referred to as a relief valve, release valve by people in the industry for exactly that purpose yeah you could seal them up and none of the CSOs would discharge, but the amount of domestic flooding 
you'd get on the back of that. You've also got the the fact that actually the patterns of weather have changed and the sewers were designed to cope with a pattern of rainfall. And this is kind of a global aspect of this that isn't true anymore. You know, certainly here in the UK, they were designed for long, continuous periods of, of kind of steady rainfall. Yeah, we do still get that. Certainly from this winter, it would be, it would be proven, but it's the short, sharp storms now that cause all the problem. And they're also the things that are the hardest to keep at the sewers. Actually, you can keep those longer duration kind of low intensity pieces. You can use all the, all the kind of surface draining surface water mechanisms, which are absolutely needed and really help. But actually, if you, if you have an incredibly sharp and high intensity storm, it's going to get in there. Now, where, it, where you probably get an interesting piece that you were going before is actually, well, can you get to the point when you can discharge because you know it's only storm water? So that second flow piece you were talking about before, that's something that's not really been done at the moment. Moment. And with all the talk around water quality legislation and requirements kind of moving hit into place in the UK in a year's time, that could be an interesting angle to go forward. It's actually, are we taking the conversation to say we want to get below 10 spills? Or are we taking the conversation to we want to have zero impactful spills? I don't think that's quite in the dialogue at the moment. And just an observation there, because we are in London um, in another summit, right, a month ago, and uh, there were city of Paris, uh, London, uh, New York, so many cities. And there was a cohesive, you know, positioning that they are committed to zero spills. What's going to take together? But nobody want, want to be driven by meeting the regulation. Well, that's also when, when it's one combined entity. When you've got a body that's responsible for two different bodies looking at uh, pluvial and fluvial flooding, mm -hmm. that actually you've got a body that's looking at surface water management and also a different body that's looking at kind of underground water management. Well, if they're not actively working together on this, you've got no chance of resolving that. Because we also work with C40, the leading cities of the world, and that's a challenge you've actually started to look with them as to how they can predict and manage the impact of stormwater, actually looking at it for, say, human safety impact. Where's going to get flooding? Where do we need to proactively manage and actually get kind of resources out to help protect people on this? That's the focus of that. We're still kind of helping and working to say, actually, we need to connect with the utility providers here so we can we can solve the same problem and it's that's been a battle for years you know there's one of the things around sustainable kind of drainage is actually looking at green spaces urbanized green spaces getting funding for that through a traditional water process is really difficult there's loads of funding coming through kind of air quality and green spaces impact air quality in cities getting those two kind of schemes put together so the impact in the right places again is one of those things that we need to get better at as urban areas there's a lot to unpack into that i will just reiterate the people because i had a conversation that microphone with um, Glasgow City Council that's in Edinburgh, not that far from Glasgow, where they have this approach of having merged together every single water entity so that they could have those management of green spaces, keep the water on the surface, the smart canal and stuff like that. That's kind of a hint into the direction where it should be going. I have story time, <laughs> my personal life. <laughs> I'm the son of a hydraulic modeler. When people were watching like cartoons as kids, we had like VHS, but not of cartoons. We had like Flood 1991 was a good one. <laughs> uh, Flood 1993 was a good one. So my father used to record those. And we knew that when we were going out on vacation just after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, you would have one out of two year a flood event and he would leave to go and, and have a look at that. But he has been working his entire career on the same place, same department, same catchment area. So he knew that looking at three specific flow meters, he would have a pretty accurate idea of if he could go out and ski with us or if he has to take the car and go home because that something's going to happen. Where I'm leading with that story is that what this would tend to tell me is that the truth is not so much in the network because when you're in the network, you're almost too late to act because you get like reactive to what's happening out there in the catchment. The truth is in modeling what's happening in the catchment and in getting like the accurate data at all those ponds. Models exist. It's a conversation I had on that podcast as well with Imre Takax from Dynamita. Modeling exists since the 80s. And it's another conversation that I want to throw all of them that I have with Katium about the specific modeling of the catchment of a water basin, for instance. Yeah. The tools exist. Absolutely. Why can't we just align on saying, hey, we take everything under one roof and we act on it. And the reason why I'm raising this question to you, when I might be raising the question to a municipality or something like that, is that as a company building a vertical cold water utility and looking at this kind of stuff, you would have the power to say, hey, maybe what I'm missing is grab Catium or something like that, grab a sensor company and put everything under one roof and say, that is our solution to whatever is happening in terms of stormwater management 
sewer overflow and sorry 12 questions in one <laughs> <laughs> i think there's a couple of them i can probably unpack without coming back on that so aside from the comment of models are as good as the point when they were finished being put together models for wastewater have historically been really challenging because they're not pressured you don't have constant flow just the whole dynamic of it is completely different you couple that with the fact that They've never really had much data be put into them, let alone any real-time data, because the kit wasn't installed. Even where you've got pumps in the network, actually getting usable flow rate data from those pumps is not common. So I think the, the role of models within this is changing. And actually, we have to utilize what's already been in, put in place. There are no consideration. There's no consideration of we have to start again on this. It's just, it's impossible. But whether it's looking at existing pumps, how do we connect those through? Existing instrumentation, existing models, how do we layer into that things like accurate kind of hyperlocal rain forecasting models? How do we actually put the machine learning piece? How do we, that, that piece you were talking about, your dad's experience that he knew under those conditions, under those sensors, he had to go and do something, but that was at one place. Actually, how can we, the solutions exist have exactly that approach across the whole network you can do that with data that's already in you might want to put additional kind of data collection sources in if you've got particular hotspots or actually one of the main the main things that metasphere did that really got grumfast excited was the art sewer piece was actually around getting visibility of sewer networks getting past just understanding a discharge point because it's you're back into that it's too late you're just reporting at that stage not if, preventing. if you want to get into that prevention piece you have to you have to build an actual model that gives you what's going on in the network. And to do that, you have to start getting more information. Actually, one of the key parts of, of my role with Grunfoss going forwards is how do we how do we build what you were just talking about? Because we have a lot of the building blocks. If you look actually a lot of the work that's been we've got pumps and we've got a deep, deep understanding of pumps and how they operate and, and actually what what the curves of performance mean on those. But you start to link that with some of the existing digital tools around condition monitoring, around remote performance of pumps, into some of the work done by Metasphere, into understanding flows and dynamics of flows within the network and catchments. And you start looking at saying, well, actually, we've got a good flow rate here. You can actually model through expected flows across catchments, as well as understanding the risk at your discharge points. And then you start to get into some of the river quality pieces and say, well, we know, is this water utility problem? Is this an agricultural problem? Is this a road runoff problem which is not something that's really talked about very much at all but it's a massive contaminant if we don't start thinking about this as my usual piece is kind of a holistic network or a series of kind of connected assets that we, we have to do that mm. it's absolutely mandatory but if we don't start getting a kind of a broader stakeholder engagement on this to actually try and solve the problem rather than just solving bits of the problem we're going to well, we'll spend the rest of our careers talking about it yeah. you, you mentioned the roads and the wash off i don't have the exact statistic in mind anymore but a good percentage of the microplastics we see are actually what's washed off from the tires which leave stuff on the roads so let alone brake dust and tire bits of tires and all kinds of horrible stuff that's in there yeah absolutely which and it's part of my notes I took in your workshop you had earlier today, which leads me to all those stories around the sewer overflows. It's bad press. You will never have like good press about, hey, no sewer overflow. That's supposed to be the standard. Even if people don't get that, maybe it's good that from time to time you have an overflow of rainwater. That is something that people can grasp and understand. So what they do is that they grasp it and they express their misalignment with, with what's happening because that's, yeah. Pretty straightforward. Shit water goes to the river. <laughs> How do you bring that other message forward that it's not only that? Yes, some of what's in the sewer is going to the rivers and we should manage that. But what we said before about what's happening in the treatment plants, all the other sources like agricultural runoff and stuff like that, and all the other aspects which have, need more education, more more M misuse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sewer so, so misuse, yeah. yeah. Mm. Is that part of your mission? The bad press and the vilification of Ford companies over CSO discharges, I feel decidedly, I have two faces on it. I have one which is, yeah, that's really bad. And it's, I think the scale of it, the fact that it's happening is, I understand because of what I do, but some of the biggest kind of bad press has been around the choices that those companies have made and how they've behaved around it. Actually bringing a light to that, I think is an incredibly good thing. And actually, if we hadn't had this change in the public's engagement with this, 
would we now be seeing the drive we're seeing to get this result in, the, in what we're talking about doing? Yeah, but not certainly not on the timeline we're now talking about. So actually, whilst it might be very uncomfortable at the moment, I think it's an incredibly good thing. The continued general education, yeah, I think that's everyone's responsibility. It's certainly everyone's responsibility who is engaged with it and understands a bit about it. I think the conversation we were having earlier is, is the understanding about choice. That's never talked about. It's just a, you did this, you're bad, you're wrong. But that's a, I think that's a general current kind of media representation thing more than anything else. If you're looking at an example of how the industry has tried actually quite hard and hasn't got there yet in terms of managing that education and PR pieces around wet wipes. So back to the misuse piece, we're still not there on that. Fat berries. We're not even close to being there on yet. And actually that's got quite broad public consensus. What lessons can we learn mm. from that in terms of what can we do and actually what do we need the public to do to make this happen? We talked about the challenge. We talked about what mm. you're building with your water utility vertical and division at Grunfos, I would like to have like a bit of hope. <laughs> <laughs> like what's wh what are you building and where are you heading towards? And in your glossary, which you distributed to people attending your, your round table, there is gold standard. Gold standard, what the water sector should be aiming for, the key objectives and strategies to provide the best possible outcomes. It's written next to a Grunfos logo, so I guess that's what you're building. What is your offer to those utilities? What are some numbers where you can say, working with Grunfos and our suite of solutions, today you could unlock this, 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 and down the line, on top of that, you're going to have also the this and this. Replace the this with actual facts. <laughs> Source security was just born, literally, which is, and, and is the most mature of the four themes we chose to set the direction of the water utilities. And just to put some context at one, on the groundwater and irrigation side, we are dealing with the sustainable aquifer management. If you are a pump company contributing to the problem of uh, depleting our aquifers from having this vantage point, how we can make sure that in our roadmap of innovation, we're going to have the sensors and everything that actually helps our customers understand when to move, how, and, and you know how to replenish. So back to the sewer security side, this is really part of our thought leadership. So it's really not about the one that we find. Before we go back to, to, yeah. to the sewer security. Yeah. So you, you said four. Sewer yeah, security. Four. So let's talk about the four uh, drivers. I'll say drivers, even back to your, is that about drinking water, wastewater? I'll say that not really about that, but about what's going to drive sewer security, whatever it takes, what's going to drive sustainable aquifer management. We uh, kindly call SAM. Energy transition. That's a that transversal, right, to actually to ground force in all divisions. And uh, water access, that's the one I mentioned before in terms of our ambition, right? And we have a whole division with more than 20 people just dedicated. 10% of the energy in the world is consumed by pumps. Mm -hmm. As Tom alluded to swiftly between two transitions today, the water sector alone has five times more carbon emission than the entire aviation sector. And a lot of that is the pumps. So what is your hot take on energy transition. What are you... So energy transition is all about climate, right, for us and decarbonization. So it's really in the agenda for Grunfos. By the way, we are the first water solutions company with a validated SBTI, so the science-based net zero target, which is a huge process to even be approved. So with pride that we change frameworks, we had to hire experts to even get there, right? So this means that we have a whole roadmap. By 2030, we are committed to 50% reduction in absolute numbers of scope one and two. But 99% of our footprint is in scope three. So although this sounds fancy, it is a huge challenge to get that resolved when a product is out of our gate, right? Super yeah. fair for you to, to mention this straight away. Because you set a target of 50% on scope one and two, and actually... We have a scope target. Three, scope three is your customers, right? It's our customers. Uh, it's upstream and downstream. So it's supply chain as well as... So how do you... It's scope, two is, it's scope two is energy, right? So our supply chain in terms of energy and three encompasses the yep. customers and the entire supply chain. So but Do you have a target on we that? Have a, we have a target. So by uh, 2030... We're going to have a commitment for 25% reduction in absolute scope 3. And by 2050, net zero across all scopes, 1, 2, and 3. How do you do that? You do that with Wi-Fi water, wireless? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a whole framework. Climate action, water action, circular business, water access. So there is a whole. And even this is a commitment in the SBTI. So the parameters that you're setting for this commitment has been audited and reported through the most reliable. One of the big things that we look at is things like natural capital. There's actually 
actually quite a lot of recent talk around the fact that we don't value natural capital properly. And actually, it certainly doesn't get its way properly into business case justifications. All of the existing target driven around sustainability, none of it actually makes allowance for what we've just been talking about doing. It's all around efficiency. You think about it as a pump company, it's all going to come down to how much energy they make and how they're built and how we can enforce that. But actually, when you start looking at the capability we can drive and the benefits we can drive, you can actually get net positive actions out of a lot of stuff we're starting to do. At the moment, that is quite difficult to calculate. But there's a lot of work being done, not by us, but actually by bodies as to how we do that properly to really get everyone thinking along these lines. Beyond the joke I made about wireless water, to get my understanding right on that, that means pumps will always need to consume energy, which means they will always have a kind of impact, even if that energy becomes fully green, it's going to have for sure, but still there will be some residual impact. What you're saying is that, for instance, if I'm keeping water on the surface, then I'm recreating green space. That green space has to have a positive impact, in which case my kind of nature-based solution, which is actuated way to have an extensive part of the network, will compensate for those emissions. And that's just one example we're picking on because that's probably the hardest to measure. You yeah. might have some other ones which are easier to measure, like biogas production, you know, waste with treatment and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So that's how you bring everything into a... Ba- it's bringing things into a balance. It's not like bringing energy to zero and then yeah. okay you have verticals sewer security is a vertical sustainable aquifer management is a vertical and then you have uh, water access i guess is a vertical as well and then the horizontal would be energy transition yeah so they are drivers of our strategy i see the, yeah they're they are drivers and enablers so basically when you decide from a product development perspective right from a marketing activation you set your focus, our founder would say, the world is full of problems that we can solve in a better way. If you try to really resolve the thousands that is in our reach, we're not going to have an impact in all. So like streamlining that focus is more for really a business strategy standpoint, which follows through with our marketing strategy, with our product development strategy, with our M&A strategy. So we empower ourselves to be not only start the conversation, like sustainable aquifer management doesn't have the material that sewer security has. This is a bold. This, this took like internal chills to be overcome for us to even be talking about as a pump company. You don't talk about depletion of aquifers, right? You are pumping water. Yeah, plus if if the aquifer is depleting, you need stronger pumps, bigger pumps. So it just depletes it faster. (laughs) But that's the thing. The numbers are huge and we had enough. We're not only pumping and and contributing to the degradation, but why we do that? You have a huge footprint of carbon. And this is what tolerance is, is that we have had enough. We are making our own assessment. We're being vulnerable and transparent, but we're also going to create a business module that addresses the strategy. So this is more so a driver and a strategy that you want to fulfill. And this is just the beginning. Good. Really great on you. But why? <laughs> because we are not a pump company. We are water solutions, right? Our purpose is to really create solutions uh, to address the water and climate challenges. Yeah, I think you used the word in there that actually is the driver of this. People don't work for the company because their purpose is to work for a pump company there might be some still because that's how they started right but i think there's the increasing recognition that people want to make a difference well, at the point when the the metasphere acquisition was coming to a close there was such a clear alignment on those cultural purposes that at that stage from being in the outside we could see that this is before the kind of piece around social security and the sustainable black for management you could see that drive to make a difference and i think this is giving it a body this is giving it a really targeted specific body that the parts of the organization can really get behind and it might be one of those it might be multiple of those but it's it definitely embodies that purpose in, in, a, in a fit that's right for today. Coming back to my, my question on sewer security, I'm super happy about the sidetrack because we learned a lot of stuff here. What would be your drivers and what you can offer your customers when it comes to sewer security, which you can then put like facts and figures and say, working with Grunfos, here's your perks. There's a couple of things. I mentioned before that our position is we, we're not requiring to anyone to replace anything. So we will work with them and where they're at because everyone's at a different stage on their journey on this one. We have lots of bits of the puzzles we can plug in there. We have a huge amount of expertise in the organisation about lots of parts of that chain. And actually what where we're going to get to with this is actually broadening out those engagements and partnerships with other bodies. We can be that organization that brings that wrap around it. I could easily sit here and say, yeah, we're going to come to you and you're not going to have any spills from your network when you deploy this solution. Yeah, I could say that, but proving it is something quite different. At the moment, there are too many things that even if we took that wholesale approach, there would be too many things that are still outside of our control. So it, it's going to have to be that that kind of long-term partnership with a utility. We're quite happy to put skin in the game on this. We have that approach that 
we will do this as a partnership. It's not a, you're going to pay us all this money and we're just going to go and do some stuff for you. And then if it something doesn't quite go right, we walk away. It can't operate like that. This is not going to change overnight. Broad answer to a broad question. So my bad. Let me be more specific. I'm going to take two use cases. And for each of these use cases, you're going to give me one single added value you can bring as Grunfos. My use case number one is probably going to be for you. My use case number two is probably good for you. Use case number one, I'm a UK utility name kept private because we don't want to point fingers. And I have that problem of sewer overflows and I might be undercapitalized right now. So I'm not quite sure I can put some CapEx into my network. What can you do for me? The move to non-CapEx based solutions isn't restricted by supply chain. It's actually generally restricted by the need to get things onto the balance sheet here by the way that the utilities work. What I will actually say is, in other areas of the world, we are offering the kind of smart sewer solutions as a full, as a service model. We're charging them as a as a X amount per day. And I say X amount because it varies slightly depending on where you're in the world and what they already have. That is absolutely not a restriction to doing something. And you can start small. You can start a catchment, you can start a subcatchment. We're doing work where we're looking at modelling the impact of rainfall at a subcatchment level for utilities in North America at the moment, saying, actually, we can tell you exactly on your trunk mains where this is hitting and where it's coming from the network. And we could start to model down the impacts of those into actually your, your problem areas. It isn't a CapEx issue. From a UK perspective, there is a timing issue, which anyone who operates here will understand understand pretty well at the moment but it's we're also seeing an acceleration into unpay at the moment as people are starting to use transitional funding to get things started it can be done as capex it can be done as opex and whether or not anyone is actually really looking at a totex conversation here there is a way of getting things done great answer but i feel like then my second use case isn't that pertinent either but i'm going to try it nevertheless my second use case is going to be u.s based this time the u.s has these study done by the epa regularly about the states of the networks and every time it's a bit worse so they have crumbly networks to, to put words on it. Roughly 32% on the latest study of the network were in out of order or time elapsed categories. So really the cost to bring back that into shape is at the latest estimate 600 something billion dollars. Okay, pretty bad situation to start with, which means that they are leaking 150 liters per day per capita. Does Grundfos has a solution for that? I think from a pure, yes, <laughs> <laughs> take some of that out. From a pure leakage piece, then actually as a field, as a field hardware solution, actually, when you think what Grundfos is known for, no, from a digital solution, Yes. One of the tools within the digital suite uh, is called Grunfoss Utility Analytics. And one of the main things it does is it incorporates AMR, AMI data into the platform, along with all the GIS information, anything you got from SCADA. And it will look at things like condition assessment. So you look at risk risk kind of categories within your network of actually bits of pipe replacement, where you've got expected leakage based on those flow rates and your AMR dates. That is perfectly doable within the tools we have today. From a traditional, we have these bits of kit we can send out to the operatives in the field. No, we don't do that. But actually, from a don't coordinated kind of system solution piece, we have that today. And I think that in itself is quite indicative of the of the journey that Grunfoss are going on at the moment, are moving away from just being a pump company. None of the four drivers are digitalization, digital, right? But they are pretty much the enabler of everything we mentioned. And source security is kind of when you ask, you ask about the golden standards, it's a big problem. Nobody has a solution, but definitely need to work around. And technology and digital is the path, right? I noted it and I'm so glad of it mm -hmm. because that's that's a good sign because companies with the digitization as, as a driver in 2024 is so 2000-ish. I mean, it's, it's a horizontal, so it's, yeah. it's good that you treat it that way, in my very humble opinion, which is worth what it's worth. To, to close that deep dive, I have a simple question, which is, I get that Grunfos is no longer a pump company, that you are into a transition period. You have a lot of target by 2030, so please, for each of you, complete me that sentence. By 2030, Grunfos is? By 2030, Grunfos is a climate, environmental, water solutions company. I would say that we are on the climate business. We are on the decarbonization business and the water business as a brand. It's a big ambition, but that's, I mean, marketing. So I can, I can have I was going to say, spot the marketing versus yeah, the technology the, person. The, the technology, <laughs> the rationale, I'm like, what the emotion is going to evoke? But My kind of North Star I'm trying to change at the moment is how do we build as a network, as a service set of tools? That fits into that broader discussion of how do we plug in and actually how do we change things? And actually, how do we, we get to the point where we're really monetizing, you know, you know meters flow, mm -hmm. meters flow out of a pump. 
sell a pump that way. If we can actually get an organization as big as ours into that kind of path, then we can shape the world a bit differently. I think we have two half of the same truth and uh, reconciling it together is pretty interesting. Thanks a lot for everything you shared in this deep dive. To round it off, I have a set of rapid fire questions which are tailored for the Blue Tech Forum. So you're going to note that. So I leave it up to you if you want to answer both of you all of the questions or if you want to design someone of you who answers each of the questions. It's time for the rapid fire questions. The first one is what is your definition of innovation in action? Collaboration is, oh, I think it's uh, breaking out from the, the thinking of the water, right? Water talks to water and do a great job on that, right? It's when you break out of the bubble and we really take one agenda. We have one goal and we all see that actually, right? But how can you really make that stronger to the Elon Musk of the world? And, you know, so for me, innovation that we need, where we need to go, the scale we need to go is to do the great things you're doing, faster pace, higher scale and out of uh, our ecosystem. You mentioned Elon Musk in between. He has solved the water crisis. I don't know if you know, but uh, <laughs> desalination and solar power, that's it. You said it. So it's, it's good. So I, I'm not even sure why we all meeting here because problem why solved. Why did but... I even bring this name <laughs> up? <Yeah. laughs> that gave you a, bit, a little bit more time to think about innovation and <laughs> action. Sorry for the rant. With, without <laughs> being thrown off by Elon Musk. I think where I was going with that is actually innovation and action for me is living with change with purpose. So innovation is actually just about change. It's not about technology because it's as much process and people. Actually, if we have change and purpose and drive to do it, innovation and action will happen. What is the most innovative water solution you've seen in the past 12 months? Technology can be a module for you. Up to you. I remember seeing a year ago, one of the simplest but brilliant innovation solutions I've had for a long time it was almost these tiny little, almost like rubberized peas that were injected into the clean water network, and they were almost sucked into a leak. And I really can't think what they're called, but it was this incredibly simple, brilliant innovation for solving leaks in the network, certainly small leaks in the network. I think the innovations that enable water access to scale, some incremental innovation, but that still uh, enable millions to get access, like solarized pumps, things like that. They water ATM. They have been incremental from a technology standpoint, no breakthrough there. It's just the way they were framed, targeting the, uh, you know, Africa and Asia. And I think that this really, for me, is at the core of innovation, right? Enabling water access. In one word, what is the biggest challenge facing the water industry today? Consensus. <laughs> that's a good one. Fear. Oh, that's an interesting one. I, I have to refrain myself to go on a sidetrack because if not, we're going to be locked in the building. <laughs> Who is a water innovator you admire and why? I'm not going to choose a person person, but I'll choose a company. And it's Kronfos. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not that cheesy, right? So it's the choice of being British. Um, I'm actually going to say PUB because they don't, do, they don't do innovation for the sake of it, but they recognised a long time ago that without material and continuous innovation, they had societal collapse issues. And it's got so embedded into the culture there. You know, and we've seen this as an organization that trade and deal with them as well as someone who's trying to do different things with them. They engage on the public forum, they engage on the international water forum. And it can be simple people process and it can be actually, yeah, we like that technology, but we're actually going to bring you into our ecosystem and we're going to nurture you and we're going to actually help you build and grow because that makes, it gives them more security about what they're trying to do. And I'm not really aware of anyone else that takes it to that level. I'll give you a person because I'm a great admirer of him is Mehu Patel. He's uh, Orange County Water District, right? And I think that he's an example that um, even in the midst of uh, uh, public opinion, strong public opinion against it, uh, in the political scenario of the barrier gain of the funds, in the challenges of the technology and uh, the, the liability that brings with that, it's solvable. You know, not only the direct report were used, but we are up for DPR and that's the answer for much of the crisis, right? It's interesting because your, your stellar example of innovators are end users slash utilities, which is an interesting pattern. What's one single piece of advice you would give to emerging water entrepreneurs? Uh, understand what drives the market because that will drive your timing and engagement but it also drive who you engage with mm -hmm. because it means things don't happen that quickly and you need to plan for that unfortunately <laughs> back to the one word I gave on the fear I think fear can scare away fear can bring scarcity I think sometimes our sector is perceived by having too much fear 
to move quick or right to take risk or to bring new technology but it's really not as we just need to be conservative talking about safety so i think for these entrepreneurs just don't scare away thinking that there is no world adopters there's only fear like just see through and uh, actually enable us to convert fear into something what's the common misconception about water innovation that you'd like to debunk i've probably said it a couple times already it doesn't have to be the shiny new thing that is a common perception that it has to be you know it has to be at kind of technology levels of innovation that's it can be something incredibly simple i'll, I'll go back to our access as my main theme today i think that we need to understand that yes yeah, we uh, try to bring global frameworks and everything but just keeping in mind that the local the communities they know the best for them and i think that kind of not trying to really push something in but really being humble to enable and empower the communities with something simple was about empowerment more than just new technology, new everything. So it's about creating this scale of SMEs, right? Within the communities, uh, again, on the what access theme that I <laughs> I've spoken a lot. What is one watch taboo that you broke or that you believe we should break? That we should break is the cycle for treated wastewater. And that is a widely used water source. I subscribe to that one. <laughs> yeah, I think reuse the uh, right, uh, just from toilet to tap. This is... Uh... But not that one. No. <laughs> no. Yeah, the, that, that wording doesn't exist. Yeah, we we yeah. delete it. It's it's out of history. It's uh... it's done. Yeah. So we don't need to break it anymore. Yeah. It, it doesn't count. Okay. <laughs> the point is good. We just don't use the word toilet to tap. They don't exist. Oh, what's the new try? Whatever, which is not that. Just not, okay, just not toilet to tap. <laughs> I, I guess what you said before, DPR, they are put them oh, over yeah. use. Uh-huh. Or second life water or new water like PUP does or what you want actually. Uh, already pre-loved water. Whatever, you know, these, these second-hand websites sites are using but not toilet to tap that's just yeah, yeah. a disaster it's, it's, it's <laughs> using fear at the really wrong place but yeah. Yeah, my two cents last question for you what can and should I do for you share the we talked before around the continuing role for education people like you in the role you have have a, a completely different reach to those of us who sit in the specific application starts the market you have a voice that's different to ours and it's important to carry that educational piece. That's just because you're not following the Xalem footprints. Just just sponsor Manchester United as they have City and, and then you don't need me. <laughs> I was going to say provoke and here he comes with a provocation. I would say you are in a great chair to provoke but also to connect, right? So uh, you really see some dotted lines that we in our day to day are just not seen and I think bringing people together with the same right agenda it's a unique position you have too. Well, thanks a lot for everything you shared today. We would be kicked out of that house all together so that's cool we have a new thing in common if people want to connect with you where shall i redirect them the best linkedin is probably still the easiest LinkedIn. option generally linkedin yeah so as always i looked at the, the description in the descriptions you find the links to both of your linkedins thanks a lot for thank you, having been with me today thank and you, talk to you soon yes yeah, thank you was a very fun chat thank you <laughs> Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.